Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with another video for this time we are going to be going with Gambit. We did Streets a few days ago and uh, that got quite a good reception so I'm really uh, glad you guys enjoyed that video. And uh, we will be doing the other dungeons later on because I have been asked to do them. So we will have Gambit today. In a few days time we will have Sanguine Depths and then the next one will be the other side. If there are other specific ones you want me to bring forward first, instead of leaving them at the back end of the playlist of these dungeon guides, please let me know in the comment section below. Give the video a like and make sure you click that subscribe button to the channel. It'll help me greatly and I hope this uh, YouTube thing works. That'll be awesome because uh, I'm loving streaming and I'm quite happy with making YouTube videos. They're quite, quite nice to do. And I've been getting a lot of good feedback, so hopefully you guys enjoy this one as well. So, we're going to start off today with a Gambit. Now, this is only a plus 20. I know some of you would be like, oh, only a plus 20. Um, this is this is an average ballpark, I think, which is not for the highest of content um, completionists and not for the average player as well. It's somewhere you meet in the middle, so you can still screw up some mechanics and make the time, but it is a bit more punishing than your standard 10 to 15s and whatnot. So, we're going to start off with Gambit today. There are plenty of different routes you can do. This one is just going to be a very simple, pug-friendly route, nothing special. There's only one woe you need to really get uh, through the encrypted mobs, and everything else is pretty self-explanatory. So, we're going to go off with the most important things you need to do, and a pull-by-pull -pull guide on where you need to go. So let's start off the start off the VOD here. Now this is again a 20. Now I'm on my Blood DK once again, which is my main tank. I do play almost every tank. I'm right now working on a DH. So the DH will be the last tank I'll do. And I have been asked to do tank guides. So if you guys would like to see that too, please let me know so I know what kind of... Uh, what kind of audience is looking for the tank guides and what tank I should do? I'll probably start off with Blood DK and then move on to the others later. So right now we're going to go left side. Because this is a fortified week, we are going to be lusting the first pull that we do. So we've got a bunch of mobs here. There's so many nameplates going on. This is probably going to be very jarring for a lot of the player base. Seeing so many nameplates, you don't really know what to kick and what to stun and what to stop. So we're going to pull three packs, there's going to be two main packs of uh, Murlocs, and then there's going to be a small pack of Shore Runners. Shore Runners don't really do anything, they're just filler mobs, and then you've got a Goliath up the top left, which we're going to pull in midway through the pack. So we're going to go through, our Hunter's going to pop Lust, I'm going to grab everything. First off, you can see Star here and Moon here, they're both going to be casting Water Bolt. This is pretty much the only interrupt you need to get because it targets the tank, and it does quite a substantial amount of magic damage, so make sure you interrupt it. Everything else is, you can, you can kind of let go. So, <clears throat> water bots are going off. Nothing really important here, except for, if you just saw that. Let's go back again, let's have a look. So, there is a mob in most packs called a Scale Binder. This is your number one mob you should be killing and targeting. Everyone should be killing this immediately. The thing that this drops is called a Fish Stick. I need to emphasize that <laughs> for purposes. That needs to be stunned, or knocked back. You can displace it, but stunning it is essential. Otherwise, it's going to place a, 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 a stick on the ground that will periodically pulse out healing for everything around it. And it is very annoying to deal with, especially if you're trying to kill a big pack like this, because everyone has to swap to it in order for the mobs not to fully heal again. This is your most important thing to stop. Now, we have one more important cast that needs to be stopped. And I'm pretty sure it's called Cry of the Murgle. Now let's have a look. They usually start at about 50% health. So Cry of the Murgle, here we go. At about 50% health whenever you get these Shell Crushers here in a pack. Usually there's about one or two in each pack. You'll get a cast called Cry of the Murgle. If this cast goes off, everything, all Murlocs I'm pretty sure around it, will be enraged. And that will most likely one-shot your tank in any scenario if you do not stun it. So people need to be assigned to the fish stick, and people need to be assigned to the cry of the Murgle. Now, Tidal Stomp is unavoidable. It's an AoE that the Goliath does. It is a little bit sketchy at a higher tier, a higher tier key, but right now, plus 20, we're okay. We can deal with it, no problems. Our healer is fine with it. Now, 
it does periodically ramp up each stack you get. You do not lose your stacks of Tidal Stomp. So you need to make sure you kill this in a timely fashion. Otherwise, things start to get a little hairy. The only other thing this mob does is places... It uh, throws a rock at a player. And it will stun and do a big amount of damage if you do stand in it. So you need to make sure you're not standing in it. Otherwise, there are some swirls on the ground. Just move out of the swirls. Standard, standard gameplay move out of mechanics, right? So that's the Tidal Stomp. That Cry the Merble goes off. The rock is about to be thrown. You can see it right there. Very, very easy to see. And we're going to slowly kill this Goliath until it's dead. And we're going to go for the second pack. Now, if you can notice as a Blood DK, I'm trying to keep my rune weapon up the whole time. My rune weapon is still going, which is this left number here, going to 6, 5, 4. As I'm pulling the next one, I'm trying to make sure I can keep my rune weapon up as long as possible so I can have a perma rune weapon. I use my I use my tombstone to get my rune weapon up again just in case it does drop mid pull. Now these are the same things. Same kicks you need to do. Vol volatile puff, not really that um, important to kick. That's just the ones that spawn the swirl on the ground. It'll be volatile puffer fish I'm pretty sure. Cry the Murgle goes off again but since it's a 20 it's alright, it's not too bad. Can keep yourself self-sustained. Water bolts need to be kicked. And everything else is pretty self-explanatory. So you've got all these, they're dying, perfect. Now we're going to move on to the next pack, which is going to be the far left. Now this pack is a little more annoying because it is a double pull with two scale binders and two shell crushers. So that means there's four different things you need to stun. This is where your AoE stuns and AoE fears are going to come in very, very, very um, clutch. So I get a mass grip to make sure everything comes together. We get some stuns onto the main important things where we don't have any fish sticks coming down, which is great. Now they're all at about 50%. The Cry of the Murgles are going to come out. They will probably go off. They do. But since we have enough damage and our Survival Hunter is absolutely slapping the damage right now, pumping 100k on the packs there, we are able to kill that very, very quickly. So now we're going to go to this pack over here. There's only one Scalebind here once again. There's going to be a pack of Shore Runners coming in as well. You do not want to pull that Goliath, so be very careful where you're standing. Again, two Water Bolts with Fishmancers going off. As a Blood DK, I can just deal with it. If you're another cat, if you know another tank, maybe like a Monk or, or a, or a uh, Prot Warrior, and you don't have Celestial Brew or Spell Reflect for those Water Bolts, it can get a little bit hairy if they're not interrupted by your, uh, by your group, but... You do have a lot of utility and defensives to work around. So everything will die over here, nice and quick. So we're going really quick through this key. Um, finishing this area with around 55 to 50, or 51 to 57 percent is good. So you can skip a few things at the end if you want to. Right now we're just doing going with the 51 percent. I'm pretty sure, and we're not going to skip anything after this. Um, this will be a pure run. We're going to do everything in uh, in Soleil's room. So that's that fish stick going off right there. So you can see right there, invigorating fish stick. This is a very annoying thing. Do not let this go off. This is the number one thing you should never let go off. Otherwise, it just slows down the key immensely. This needs to be prioritized. So water bolts are going off again. Now here we get woe. This is the woe I was talking about at the start of the key. You need to make sure you get woe here because this allows you to skip everything else you do not need into the first boss room straight away. So as we're going through, we've got Woe for another 55 seconds. We're going to kill this Wave Jumper and Shell Crusher. And once they're dead, we will go straight through to the first boss. Now with the bosses, once again, I'm just going to go through it very, very simply. Because the mechanics are very structured and it's very easy to deal with. There's nothing really crazy different in the boss fights. They're very, um, very streamlined in the way their abilities work. So there's only a few abilities here. Now... A very important thing about Hildebrand, oh sorry, Hil Hildebrand, sorry, not Hildebrand. Uh, you need to make sure that you have, uh, the, the easiest way to do it in a pug is to have a weak aura. Now I'll link the weak aura in the description below for people that don't have it, but most people do have it. It is a, uh, is a console weak aura where one person will be able to click the console and you'll be able to see the uh, pattern of the symbols come up in order. Now you need to make sure the other four people are grabbing an orb in each of these four symbols on the floor where the boss spawns and put them in their corresponding consoles on either corner of the room. 
Now, when that happens, if you all have the weak aura, the person that is manning the main console will send a message and it'll appear on your screen, assuming you have the weak aura as well, and it'll tell you exactly where to put your color. Top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. So that's how you do that portion of the fight. And the boss will go into that phase where you need to do the console at 100 energy. Now the way to prevent that energy from going up any quicker is by making sure the adds that spawn throughout the fight die very quickly, interrupting the adds and stunning the empower, which I'm pretty sure puts a defensive on the boss, which reduces damage by quite a substantial amount, so you want to make sure those are getting stunned. Now there's a frontal cone that you just dodge as the tank, make sure you're facing that away from people, and as you saw that beam, that beam that was placed on one of our players, they put that at the back of the room. No one's going to be at the back of the room, so that's where you want to place those beams. You don't want to place them in the middle of the room or on the consoles, because that's where people will be standing, and it does do quite a lot of ticking damage. So you want to make sure that's done. So I'm standing near one of the spawn points, and I'm death gripping the other one, so I can grab those two in. Now be careful of these, uh, of these adds, these vault purifiers. I don't know if this is intended, but they don't take damage and don't apply dots or have aggro an aggro table in the first two or three seconds of when they actually spawn. So don't try and taunt or grip or anything like that until they actually start moving because otherwise it'll just, it won't work and you'll have to re-taunt again and then things might go haywire and they'll start slapping other DPS and the healer and you don't want that happening, right? So Valorous Bolt needs to be interrupted, perfect. We got another player putting it at the back, fantastic work. Sanitizing cycle, this is where it is. Our healer is doing this because our healer can be in the position before the tank, uh, before the uh, boss goes into the middle. So it's a little quicker. And as you saw on my page, the Z top right in the left side there and allowed me to put the yellow orb in the correct console. So that's pretty much the first boss fight. We're just going to skip through the rest of it. Same thing goes on again. Place your stuff on, place your beams on the ground. Don't try to kill someone with the beam. Kill the adds, make sure they're stunned, make sure they're interrupted, and then kill the boss. So now a portal will spawn after the first boss is done. That's my healer trolling me with life grips. I'm sure some of you have had that before. We're going to go through the portal. Now this is the pool where a lot of people start to get a little scared. Now, previously, deckhands would do an ability that would hit the nearby target. Nowadays, with the newest patch, they only hit the tank now. So you can kite these now. You couldn't before, that's why it was a little bit scary. You had to stay in melee range, otherwise your melee would die to their abilities. Which was Haymaker. But now you can kite, so it's a lot better to deal with these packs. Still, it's a little bit of a rough pack, so we're gonna go in, make sure our parry is up the whole time, and just smash it out. Should be able to grab this. I'm gonna build my stacks, go straight in with a and d Grab everything together, I should be mass gripping soon, or maybe during it just to stop some casts. Now there's nothing really important here except for two things. One is the Tide Sages are going to cast Brackish Bolt. That needs to be interrupted, that is a very heavy hitting magic ability, and it is not nice as a tank when they go off. Especially when there's other mobs hitting you with melees that are going for like 20 to 30k each. Do not let this ability go off. There is another ability that these same mobs do, called Tidal something, I'm pretty sure. Tidal Burst, okay? Tidal Burst puts the little swirls on the ground that you'll see. Those are easily avoidable. There's no point in interrupting them. There's no point in interrupting them. Just let it go off, dodge the ability so you guys can keep doing damage. Now, Super Saison. This ability is the same as Cry of the Murgle and from the first area of Gambit. It is an enrage that enrages every, every deckhand around them and it'll do a shit ton more damage to the tank. So if you want to, you can kite at this point if you don't have an AoE stun or interrupt. Oh, sorry, AoE stun or fear. Um, but I just tank it anyway. It's a 20. You'll be alright. As long as you have a parry up, you're a DK. You're unkillable at this stage you'll be alright. As long as you're cycling through your cooldowns, you're sweet. So we're going to keep going through here. Now, there is, a, there is a little trick that you can do to make this part a little quicker. While you're gathering the mobs here, if you can survive yourself, 
your healer or another DPS can run through here and start the RP for the dragon, which will in, in, in turn make this far four pack spawn early. And by the time you get here after you've killed these mobs, the five the four pack won't be there anymore, it'll be in the middle of the room, allowing you to double pull these mobs here are more efficient. Now, we didn't do that in this run, and we end up having to, you know, take a little bit more time to pull them together, resulting in me almost procking my purgatory, but that is okay. So I'm going to go to the top pack here, I'm going to grab the Tide Sage, because that is the only... Um, that is the only mob that is a ranged mob, so I'm going to interrupt that, and then I'm going to grip it, and then we're going to mass grip this, or I don't have mass grip right now, so never mind. You would want to mass grip that, but I used it on the pack before, so that's fine. Now this is essential that you keep your dancing rune up here, and you're making sure those interrupts are on brackish bolt only. See, the tidal bursts are just going off, unless Bron wants to make his entrance, and then knocks them all back anyway. Making sure the brackish bolts don't go off, because as you can see, it hurts a lot. As a DK, you need to be healing a lot here. Probably around 20 to 25k HPS on a good day. If you want to keep yourself up here. Because we don't have that many interrupts. We only have four. And two of them are a little bit low on the cooldowns. A little bit high on the cooldowns, sorry. So we've got all that. Now here is where you want to be using and getting Vi. Now because you get Ur on the boss and you're doing the boss immediately after this pack. There's no, not really any point getting Ur here. So you want to get Vi here for the little, a little bit more haste that you can get, as well as getting Ur on the boss. And by the time Vi is done, you'll have Lust for even more haste to just destroy the dragon boss very, very quickly. Standard stuff, get the Vi, make sure you don't stand in the Vi's beam. I've seen a lot of people die to that. We add a death here to Vi's beam, I'm pretty sure. Yep, as I say it, there you go. So Vi's beam, that, that's what happens, don't stand in it guys, remember. Now we'd interrupt Brackish Bolt, and no, that's going to go off, that's fine. So we're gonna, just going to stay here, make sure that we get a res, and we're going to pull the dragon. Now, a lot of people have issues with this dragon boss. It's one of the easiest bosses in the game, to be honest, and you've got to do it properly. Now, as a tank, it is essential that you are doing your job properly. And the small tips I have here. One, start the boss in the, to in the top corner here. Face the tail to the, to the ocean and the mouth of the dragon to the boat. Now you need to make sure the, the breath is hitting all the mobs that are coming out. Now you can use roots, you can use rops, you can use CCs, you can use slows, anything to make sure that they're all together. Now, you can't be in behind the boss because it's a dragon boss. People are going to get tail swiped, and every dragon boss in the game, there is a tail mechanic, so you may want to make sure that you do not stand behind the boss as a DPS or a healer. Now, as you can see, all the players are relatively close to the boss, which is good. The reason being, the mobs will have their trajectory aimed at a random player. If your player is out in Narnia over here, that mob is going to go straight through the, the, straight through the map instead of towards you. Which then makes it even harder for people to group up the mobs so your breath actually hits everything. So DPS and healers play a good part, a good role in this as well. They need to be close to the boss so that everything can get hit. Otherwise, that ain't your fault as a tank. That's everyone's positioning. Now, as you can see, we have someone getting hit by a fire, uh, one of the fire uh, balls or the cannonballs on the ground. That's not good, almost dies, but that is okay. You need to make sure you're dodging these and you're making sure that you're just slowly moving back, right? Now, as a tank, you just need to make sure you're safe, right? There's plenty of, plenty of room for the DPS to do damage. The only thing that hurts a lot is the initial hit of the, uh, of the cannonball. If you just stand in it for a little bit, it doesn't hurt too much, but you want to be obviously not allowing the healer to have to heal you for unnecessary damage. So just keep slowly moving the boss towards the boat. Now, because this is a fortified and because this is a 20, this boss is just going to melt. What you want to do for a rule of thumb in a Tyran or anything higher than a 20, if you don't have the damage, obviously, you want to make sure that it did an ability called Alter Time. Or let's have a look at when it does it. So double time, here you go. So that double time ability. So the rule of thumb here is if the boss is at quite a substantial amount of health still and it does double time, what it's going to do is it's going to do two breaths consecutively back to back. 
After the second breath, it's going to have a small window where it's not doing anything. You need to move the boss all the way back to the start of where you started the boss before. So right into that corner again. So you're just going to run through the boss, move it to the start, run it back, and, and, just, and just turn it around. So then it's starting right at the edge again, which gives you a bigger cone to hit the ads once they come out of the boat. Because as you can see, the closer the ads are towards the boss, the harder it is and the, the narrower the beam is to actually kill them. The further away they are, the easier and the more room you'll have to hit all of them. Because what happens when the ads don't get killed in a timely fashion, they enrage. And once they enrage, they're gonna run full speed at a person and just beat them to death. And that is never a fun, fun thing. So we're gonna finish off this boss. This boss is gonna die. We've had one death, that's okay. We get him a res. We're gonna go into the next area. Now, we have 77.7%. .7%. This is Soleil's room. We're gonna go in. Now, usually in most routes, you're not, or most routes, you're not gonna do this mob. This mob is usually just useless and not worth your time because it's just one mob. Doing anything with one mob in Mythic Plus is usually a waste of time unless it's absolutely necessary, like in the other side's red spirits, uh, because you have to do them, because uh, they patrol around the area and there's no really, there's no real way to dodge them until the end of the uh, end, end of the dungeon, which you need to kill them anyway. Um, but for here, we need it for percent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this, get Ur. Once Ur is down or relatively low, we're going to pull this into a 3-pack so we can get some cleave off. So, the only two abilities you need to worry about with these Starseers is Wandering Pulsar, which will spawn this orb, which does an insane amount of damage over time. So this needs to be killed immediately. This is your priority. And the Starsea is also going to do something called Drifting Star, which is going to be a frontal. It's a massive circular um, white uh, graphic right there. And it's going to aim and chuck a star at someone. If you get hit by it, you are dead. Unless you are the tank, you are 100% dead. So you need to make sure you are not standing in front of that. Now I'm going to pull the Starsea to the Ritualist, pull the Ritualist to me. And we're going to do these mobs. So Pulsar's coming up again. Drifting Star, as you can see, is facing that way. Perfect. So, these mobs here. There are very important abilities here. One is called Unstable Rift. You'll see in about two minutes, we do let an Unstable Rift go off. And it kills everyone. Except for me and anyone that uses a defensive. You need to be careful. That is the number one kick you need to get. So every Ritualist does Unstable Rift, every Accomplice does an ability called Revitalize, which is a full heal, pretty much. And they start casting it at 50%. Sorry, Reinvigorate. They start casting it at 40%, actually. 40% they'll start casting it, and it's called Reinvigorate. You need to kick that as well, but if you're going to choose between kicking an Unstable Rift or a Reinvigorate, Make sure you kick the Unstable Rift. That's the one that can kill you. Reinvigorate just heals the heals the mob itself. And then it will apply a purgeable, deb a purgeable buff that needs to be removed. So now we do a double pull here because everyone's got their cooldowns. We want to make sure everything is killed at the same time. Uh, is up. Now this is a lot of damage. Now yes, there's Hyperlight Bolts and all that going off, but that is just something the tank needs to deal with. Because you cannot be using your interrupts for anything else. Hyperlight Bolts cannot be interrupted. They need to be used for the Unstable Rifts and the Reinvigorates. So as you can see, one is about to go off. It doesn't. That gets knocked, which is good. But here we go. There's an Unstable Rift at the top there. As you can see, we have two kicks available. It's going to happen in two and a half seconds. I do not have a kick available. I do not have grip available. I do not have asphyxiate available. And I do not have mass grip. So it is out of my hands. I cannot do anything. So we need to see if it can be interrupted. Our rogue uses it on something. I'm pretty sure it's an reinvigorate in here. We have one kick available. It's about to go off. And bam. Everybody dies except for our one of our hunters that uses a turtle. As you can see here. Because he knew it was going to go off. Our rogue had just enough health to keep alive. And I am a tank. So I won't die to it. So that was unfortunate. But... The key goes on, 
Everything else gets interrupted. We keep killing him. Everything is fine. Now, we have double Starseers here. On a fortified week, never double pull this. This is outrageous to do. There's going to be too many things going on and too many things to dodge. People are going to just lose their mind. And there's going to be too many orbs that spawn the pulsars and it's just going to do too much damage. Your healer won't be able to do it. Unless it's a very, very low key. So you want to make sure you're kind of killing it. Get to about 20-30% maybe and then you can pull into the next pack because it's going to die soon anyway. So as soon as this is done, same two abilities, Wandering Pulsar you need to kill, Drifting Star you need to dodge, and then we're going to go into the last boss, Soleil. Actually, this is a perfect example. So we're going to have a Drifting Star, it looks like the Rogue gets hit here, so we're going to see, Drifting Star, Rogue is there, and boom, dead, one shot. Just to prove that it does one shot, you guys, I've got to make sure. So we're going to get a res on the Rogue, we're going to go on to Soleil. Now, Soleil is going to do, this is the phase one of the boss fight. This has two main phases. First fight, first phase, it's going to summon two adds that are assassins. They're going to come into the middle and you're going to have to interrupt them when they teleport away. If that interrupt goes off, it's going to do a ridiculous amount of damage over time and put a debuff on everyone. It is not fun. Do not let it go off. That is very important. Two, there's going to be an ability on the ground called a star. That needs to be soaked. Now, usually you would get your healer to soak it because then there's no DPS loss on the boss and you need to get this boss down in a timely fashion. Otherwise, it is going to hurt and your healer is going to run out of mana. And the healer knows when they have cooldowns available, so the healer should be doing it. If you have communications like Discord or something and you want like a ranged DPS to do it instead, that's perfectly fine as well. Just depends on what you guys are capable of and what you guys are comfortable with. Now the assassins are spawning here. There we go. Now for here, you want to use this Ur to be able to heal the star that's about to come down. Now I'm going to grip that shuriken. And the collapsing star is coming down now. So this collapsing star, as you can see, our healer, which is our priest, is going to be doing it. Now you can see there's a debuff on everyone now. This, way, this debuff acts as a multiplier. If you pop this too quickly and you still have the debuff, it'll add another stack, which will do even more damage. So you need to make sure you're looking at this timer. If you're going to be doing this debuff, and as soon as it falls off, you go for another one. Now, there is a quite a long period of time before this actually explodes. And if you haven't gotten all, at least three uh, ticks of this done by the time it explodes, Whatever is remaining, which is a total of four ticks, whatever is remaining is going to uh, be put onto everyone at the same time. So you need to make sure you either dip in three times and leave one left to explode on its own, or you dip in four times to not have it randomly creep up on you, uh, coinciding with another ability, which is uh, sometimes not a good idea. So we're going to do that. We have Ur popped, and as you can see, Ur is healing us throughout the entirety of the debuff. So the healer doesn't have to use anything, which is per perfect because it increases, it gives the healer all their mana back as well as doing the job of the healer for the entirety of a star, which is crazy good, crazy good um, efficiency. So this boss phases at 40%. Once it phases at 40%, it'll go into the middle. And this is the next ability. So you need to make sure you're going to see red lines intersecting between all five players. Each player needs to stand behind one of the stars on the ground, you have to choose. This boss takes no damage, by the way, during this phase, so there's no need to start attacking it. And you need to make sure the, the line goes through each star. Then you're going to pull this to the back corner here. And you're going to keep it over here. Now, all the abilities are the same, except for now you have a few new abilities. You still have that, you still have that, uh, that red arrow intersecting the stars happening every time the boss goes into the middle and phases again. That's how you start the phase again. It'll have this ability called Collapsing Star. I'm pretty sure it's called Collapsing Star. Hold on. Let me have a look. No, Energy Fragments. So Energy Fragments will explode each of the individual five stars, going around either clockwise or anti-clockwise, I'm pretty sure. And you just need to be looking at it, and it'll shoot projectiles out, just like the second boss in Spires of Ascension, if you guys know that boss. It is the same 
kind of idea where it's just going to shoot projectiles out of an orb. You need to make sure you dodge it. If you don't dodge it, you get a debuff and it hurts like hell. Very simple stuff. Dodge the ability. So it's going to explode. You're going to see these golden lines coming out. There it is, all the projectiles. Just dodge, dodge, dodge. Nice and good. Everyone's dodged. Perfect. Happy days. Okay. Relocation is just going to move the orbs around. Collapsing stars in a really bad place right now. And now you see this overlap here. Collapsing stars with Hyperlight Nova. Not a good time. So the healer shouldn't be running yet. But as long as there's some safety safety net or safety space over there, that's fine. As long as they make it in time. This obviously, big circle. Don't stand in it. Very obvious. It's a big get out. So they're going to do the... Uh, they're going to do the collapsing star right now while we keep ourselves up. I should be aiming here, or maybe I'm saving it for the next collapsing star. I'm not sure. But using defensives is very beneficial to make sure the healer can actually top you guys up. Because the healer is most likely going to be very far away, and you want to be very careful. Now, the boss didn't move, and that was bad, bad by me on positioning of the boss. But you don't need to be near the boss here, so people can move and dodge. So one of our DPS do die. I need to hit the boss, but I can't in order to get the B-Rays because I don't have any runic power right now, which is unfortunate. But, as you can see, we miss one because we don't have all five people available, but we get it on the second try. I'll hit the boss a little bit, get a B-Rays on Stormy, and we're going to continue the boss. We've got a minute left on Lust. Same thing, so Hyperlight Nova, move out. We're going to have the Energy Fragmentation soon. Which will mean you just have to dodge the golden projectiles once again. And then we'll also have the collapsing star where our healer will have to soak. So this is quite a quite a decent 20 run. Like we still two chest it and have about 9 minutes left I want to say. Almost 10 minutes left. But there could have been a lot of things that are... That a lot of things could have been fixed obviously. Now this is us helping someone get a 20 to uh or well, helping two people get a 20 actually to uh, make sure make sure they get their 3k IO and to help them with their portals because the portals will go away eventually in season 4 because these uh, only this dungeon is going to be available this uh, gambit and streets will only be available uh, none of the other dungeons so we're just trying to help them out but um, that's what I do on my, on my stream at uh, twitch.tv slash triple B so if you want to come along have fun and some keys uh, if you need some helping keys Please drop by, ask any questions, give it a follow, and uh, we'll have a chat. But um, I hope that explained everything about Gambit. Uh, it was a little bit of a quicker explanation than Streets because it's a lot quicker of a dungeon. But um, the next key will be Sanguine Depths, which was asked by one of my commenters in my first video. So I'll put that up in a few days. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. It really helps me out. And I'll see you guys in a few days. Peace out. Till next time.